On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, Black Sea Convoys, this is a job for Tom Hanks. I'm your host, Sam Mercaglano. Welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping. So you may be asking yourself, what the heck, Sal? Black Sea Convoys, war between Russia and Ukraine, global food situation in the balance. What the heck does that have to do with Tom Hanks? Well, the question that's being raised now in larger and larger audiences is whether or not the United States, NATO, the world should intervene to ensure that grain shipments can come out of Ukrainian ports because of the blockade and the fact that the Ru Ukrainians have mined the waters around their ports, the Russians have closed the ports. There is an issue about the lack of food being provided to the world. And I want to put out here the options that are available in the current situation. And what better medium to do that than Tom Hanks movies? For those of you who don't know, I am a history professor at Campbell University. And I am pretty sure I can do an entire course in American world history using Tom Hanks movies as the basis of it. If I throw in Russell Crowe and Mel Gibson, that's a slam dunk. I, I could do all world history based on that. So let's take a look at this and examine it. But before I do so, if you're new to the channel, please take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, Tom Hanks, unveil yourself. So before I do that, let me jump into this. This is the Black Sea. This is the area we're talking about in particular. So this is a specific area of the Black Sea. Let me zoom out here for a minute and show you. So that is the Black Sea in its entirety right there. This is Romania, here's Mold Moldova, this is Ukraine, and of course, Russia up here. This is the Black Sea, this little lake right here, or sea, this is the Sea of Azov, this is the Gulf of Odessa, and down here is the Turkish Straits, the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus. The ships in green are cargo ships, the ships in red are oilers and tankers, and the ships in blue are, are service vessels, tugs and, and oil platforms and the such. So let me zoom in here a little bit. Go right here to the area we're talking about here. So this is the Ukraine coast, all the way from these big, huge conglomerations of vessels right here at the Ukraine-Romanian border at the Danube River. Up all the way through here appears the port of Odessa, port of Nikolaev, Kyrgyzstan over here, and then this is the Crimea Peninsula. Here is the port of Sevastopol. This entire peninsula was grabbed by Russia in 2014. The heart of the Russian Baltic, excuse me, Black Sea Fleet is based here in Sevastopol. This is only a couple of hundred miles wide right here. You'll see ships stuck up in the ports here. There's actually more than what's seen there. A lot of the ships have turned off their AIS and the ships have been cold, abandoned, so they're not transmitting their AIS anymore. There are a series of oil platforms, some are Ukrainian, some are Russian, but probably all taken over by the Russians now that form a barrier across the Gulf of Odessa. Over here in this region is Snake Island. This is the island that they've been fighting over quite a bit. And this large conglomerations of vessels right here, these are largely bulk vessels that are going up the Danube and the canal system here to the ports of Rene, Ismal, and other ports in Romania to load Ukrainian wheat and grain. Now, normally they come out of here, out of the Gulf of Odessa, but those have been blocked. Again, the Ukrainians have mined the ports and the Russian Navy has been active off the coast. As a matter of fact, just as of yesterday or day before yesterday, there was a large amphibious demonstration off the coast here. Covert Shores on Twitter followed that, saw an, an entire group of Russian vessels, which I'll show you, off the coast. In the meantime, since Snake Island has been being suppressed by the Ukrainians and after the sinking of Moskova, what we see is this large con conglomeration of vessels right here that are going into the Ukrainian ports on the very south end, loading what grain they can. The Romanians and Moldavians have modified their railroads to accommodate Ukrainian railroad cars because of the different gauges involved. And now you're seeing a lot of grain come out, but these are smaller bulkers. These aren't the large, big commercial bulkers, which brings us to Tom Hanks and the whole heart of this. So first off, obviously, the, the biggest issue we have right here is a couple of things. Number one, Odessa, we have a problem. 
We cannot get our grain out of the Ukraine. Even the small bulkers, which are doing a great job, and even the bulk grain that's going out of the Romanian port of Constana isn't enough to get all the Ukrainian grain out. And again, this is dependent for the Ukrainian economy, but more importantly, it is world dependent. There is a potential here for a massive food shortage in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia if this grain cannot go out. So obviously we have a problem. It needs to be addressed. And there's more and more people that are paying attention to it. Next, you have the ships that are basically stuck in port. Nothing better than Castaway. What is Tom Hanks in Castaway? But a cargo person. He's delivering FedEx packages. This is probably a movie about the longest FedEx delivery ever impossible. How does he not open that package? Can I ask you that seriously? You have one package. What if that thing had like a satellite phone and a battery in it? And it could have saved him immediately, but he never opens it. Never understand that movie. But Castaway is the perfect example because the grain is stuck, can't get out, and there's no way to basically get the grain to where it needs to go. And that's the, the genesis of this entire story. And this is where we come to really the two big issues, the two big Tom Hanks moments we have to decide. Uh, are we going to do Captain Phillips? Are we going to risk sending in commercial vessels without escort and have to basically fend for themselves? Now, in this movie, we obviously see the U.S. Navy come to the rescue of Captain Phillips because we have to save Tom Hanks. And the U.S. Navy does it big. I mean, you send in a helicopter carrier, a guided missile destroyer, a guided missile frigate to go against four Somalis in a lifeboat. It's a lot of firepower to go against four Somalis in a lifeboat, but you got to save Tom Hanks. But for many other mariners who had been captured by the Somalis, their navies didn't come for them because many of the vessels were registered in open registries, foreign flags, and those crews weren't American crews. And therefore they languished being held by Somalis in some cases for months, if not years, until ransom was paid. And we're seeing that right now with mariners still trapped on vessels in Ukraine, mariners sailing up and down the Danube within just 15 miles of Snake Island, not knowing whether they're going to get hit or not. And so as usual, merchant mariners are on the front lines without a lot of care or concern really being expressed by them. And then the option, that the one that a lot of people don't want to do because of the fears it involves is the Greyhound option. Do we go in and escort the convoys and battle the big bad Kilo submarines and the Black Sea fleet and the air, and the air uh, potential and mines to go do it? So uh, again, you've got a kind of a pantheon of choices here from Tom Hanks. We've got the problem we've identified already, Odessa. We can't get the ships in and out of there. Crews and grains are trapped on board vessels. Merchant mariners are being subjected to high risk, high potential danger. And this is one of the reasons why you don't see vessels heading up into the Black Sea, not just the high risk for the vessels, not just for the crews, but you can't get insurance to do it. And if you can't insure a vessel, no owner is going to send their vessel in. And then finally, do you run the Navy in there to go do it? Now, Let's break this down in a little bit more detail and discuss the specifics here and some obvious issues associated with this potential problem. So this was an issue that it didn't take geniuses to figure out. And the perfect example of that is me. Back in January, I wrote an article for GCAP, and this is before the February 24th invasion, where I specifically kind of highlighted this issue where I talked about the escalation and tension between Ukraine and Russia, you know, and what it means. And what I basically said here was this, both Ukraine and Russia are major exporters of corn and wheat, and therefore major food suppliers around the world. Add to this, Russia provides nearly one third of the natural gas to Europe and is a major player in the world energy sectors. As Russia curtails shipments of LNG, American cargoes and LNG tankers from around the world have been diverted to deliver cargoes to Europe. Any conflict or even threat has the potential to interdict or raise the price of such commodities around the world. Again, this is not genius. This is just knowledge of how world trade and economy is going. I am not genius in this at all. A lot of other very smart people, I'm not one of them, came up with this and talked about it. And since then, we've seen a continue kind of 
growth in this discussion. You know, you go here to this article by Admiral Stravitas in Bloomberg back in early May. The Black Sea is the next front in the Ukraine war. I've cited this article before. This story, which is a new one by Admiral Fogo, I, I've talked about earlier Admiral Fogo pieces for CEPA, but this one, Russia's hunger blockade, is talking about the impact that it's having on the world economy. You saw these stories come out earlier this week. Uh, this one in the Express, the Royal Navy to send warships to the Black Sea and break grain blockade in urgent solution. The Royal Navy backed off on this almost immediately, saying we're not, we don't have any plans to send the Royal Navy in there. And there's an issue associated with this I'm going to talk about. Even on the Financial Times, you're seeing this story, military briefing, Ukraine seeks way to break Russia's Black Sea blockade. And even in the trade magazines, we're seeing it. Uh, Sam Chambers over at Splash 24-7 had this story with world leaders discussing deploying naval coalition to the Black Sea to help Ukrainian grain. So let's get into the meat of this and, and break it down to the, to the final element that we can basically discuss. So first off, this story, Bloomberg story of May 25th, Russian ports, red tape, and Russia risks stop Ukrainian grain. And so again, one of the things we're talking about are several things here. Resuming Ukrainian grain shipments will be time consuming given challenges that include mine clearing in the Black Sea ports and the need for cooperation from the very country that kicked off the war with Lithuanian president Nausida said. Nausida is among a small group of European leaders pushing for a naval escort for vessels shipping Ukrainian grain through the Black Sea. Russia has effectively blockaded Ukrainian ports with its invasion, including a three-month siege of the largely destroyed city of Mariupol, leaving the government in Kyiv struggling to export grain, sending prices to near record highs. You have this story right here, Russia ready to set up humanitarian corridor for ships leaving Ukraine with conditions. So the Russians have said that they will basically open up corridors to allow vessels to sail in and out. Now, let me be clear about something. There is huge distrust against the Russians because the Russians have attacked neutral vessels at the beginning of this conflict and throughout this conflict, including hitting a Bangladesh vessel in the port of Kyrgyzstan, killing an engineer on board, and then taking an Estonian owned vessel, the Helt, sailing it into the Gulf of Odessa, exposing the ship and its crew to either a mine or missile strike that resulted in the vessel sinking and two of the crew dying on board, including numerous other vessels owned by Moldova, by Turkey, by Japan, being hit early in the conflict by missiles and bombs. So the Russians don't have good credibility when it comes to this. Let's be clear about that. And the other issue here is the Russians are exporting grain right now through the Kerch Strait out of their ports, Rostov, out of Novorysk, out of the ports in Russia, and including allegations of Russian ships carrying Ukrainian stolen grain and shipping it out. But obviously, this is a huge issue. As the story notes, Russia and Ukraine account for nearly a third of global wheat supplies, and the lack of significant grain exports from Ukraine's port is contributing to the growing global food crisis. Now, Ukraine and Russia don't grow a third of the world's grain. They're responsible for a third of the grain that's exported. So be clear about that. There was some issue about this. But there's other issues at play. The idea of safe corridors are important, but the problem with safe corridors are, even if the Russians say there's a safe corridor, even if the Ukrainians say, listen, we've cleared out the mines, you can come in, a lot of ships aren't gonna do that. You're not gonna get the insurance to do that. Normal insurance doesn't cover this. You have to have what's called war risk insurance, a higher premium, very expensive, and not guaranteed you're gonna get it. And what you're gonna need is guarantees to do that. Plus, even if you sweep mines, the fact that mines have been laid has led to drifting mines coming loose. And then you may get caught in the middle of an air attack. You'll need air defense. And the issue with the Russian Kilo submarines, their diesel electric submarines that are holes in the water provide a lot of issues. Going on here with these stories, Russia is winning from the global food crisis it helped to create. Russia is, is profiting from this as they are filling the exports that were normally done by Ukraine. The war has blocked Ukrainian grain exports by sea, cutting off vital supplies from countries from Somalia to Egypt, the disruption topped by hot weather and droughts that are hurting wheat crops in other parts of the world. One of the issues we saw 
was India was supposed to step up and provide the wheat to do it. Well, India just announced they're not exporting any more wheat because of bad harvest due to uh, heat. Same thing in the United States. We can't get wheat out of the United States because shippers won't carry loaded containers out of the West Coast of the United States and their backlogs for bulkers out of Seattle, Tacoma, and Vancouver. Russia has continued to ship its wheat at the now higher prices, finding willing buyers and raking in more revenues per ton. We hear about sanctions all the time against Russia, but those sanctions are largely Europe, the United States, kind of first world nations that are, ex that are sanctioning oil, gas, some of it, not all of it, even the European Union isn't sanctioning everything. And for smaller countries, uh, less developed countries, countries that don't have the economic wherewithal of the larger countries, they're going to buy whatever grain they can get their hands on. They don't care if it's Russian grain or Ukrainian grain. And so they're going to buy it. And in a way, the Russians are profiting immensely from this and the Ukrainians are suffering. This Bloomberg story, again, this growing support here for naval escorts for the Ukrainian grain. Now, I, I'm the first one to tell you, number one, I'm not 100% sure that sending warships in to the Black Sea is the right answer because you can do a lot of escorting from shore with helicopters, with aircraft. You can send in P, uh, P3s, P8s. You can send in helicopters operating from the shore. There are NATO forces in the Black Sea, the Romanians, the Bulgarians, the Turks. Uh, and you also have the lingering issue of the fact that the, you, the Turks control the Montreux Convention of 1936, which prohibits warships from transferring through the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles. And they have basically said they're not going to allow any Black Sea, non-Black Sea nation to deploy in there. Now, they may if it's part of a NATO operation or a larger EU operation. But understand, the Turks aren't crazy about the EU. They've been excluded from it. So probably it's going to be really a tough sell. But they may allow some warships to come in. Because even if the Turks, the Bulgarians, and the Romanians undertake escort operations, you're going to wear those forces out pretty quick. They have limited assets to do this because you're going to have to run convoys. And convoys, number one, slow up the flow of goods, requires a lot of assets to do it. And even though it's a short little distance from the Gulf of Odessa down to the Turkish Straits, it's high threat areas. It's going to be a big problem for them to do it. And then, you know, this article where the Ukrainians are seeking the alternative ways to get their grain out. And it talks about really the fact how much is in there. Grain is one of Ukraine's main industries, exports totaling $12.2 billion in 2021, accounting for nearly a fifth of their exports. Prior to the war, Ukraine exported 98% of the cereals and oil seeds via the Black Sea at a rate up to 6 million tons per month. But with ports blocked, railway systems unable to cope cope with the extra volume. The country is currently only exporting one to 1.5 million tons, which means that a good chunk, about 5 million tons a month, isn't getting out. And obviously, there's a lot of challenges associated with it, but they do talk about the options here in the story. And all these options come with dangers associated with them. So in an earlier video, I talked about the potential for the Black Sea becoming the Persian Gulf of the 1980s with the tanker war. In the 1980s, Iran and Iraq went to war with each other over territorial disputes. They fought that war for eight years. It was a grueling war that they fought. And one of the collateral damages or one of the fronts became the Persian Gulf, where initially Iraq was targeting Iranian vessels carrying oil, then Iran tar targeted I Iraqi vessels carrying oil, but a lot of neutral vessels were hit. And I have a whole video that you can watch that shows you about this. The fear here is number one, obviously right now, everything is flowing good. Where war zones have been declared are the areas north of the Danube and above Sevastopol. These are the areas we're talking about. Now, no one's going into that area right now because of the war risk. We see ships coming out of the Sea of Azov, through the Kerch Strait, out of the Russian ports along the Black Sea. You can see them heading due south and then coming into this pattern heading for the Turkish Straits. The fear here is that Ukrainian vessels get targeted by Russians, Russian vessels get targeted by Ukraines, and the Black Sea devolves into the Persian Gulf. But what we're seeing right now is there's not enough capacity in the ports 
to move out the number of vessels or the tonnage necessary to sustain the grain shipments. So basically, Ukraine is not going to get all the grain out that they normally do. They're, they're operating at about one-fifth to one-sixth their capacity to export grain. What they need is the ports in the northern Gulf of Odessa. The problem is the Russians are right here along the river. Uh, the port of Mikhailov is being threatened. And more importantly, the port of Odessa has been hit repeatedly by strikes from aircraft and from sea-based missile launches that we've seen caliber missiles being launched by surface and subsurface craft. And to run past the perimeter here of the oil platforms into potentially mined areas would require minesweepers, the kilo submarines that the Russians have, which are their most potent weapon against vessels probably, would require anti-submarine technology out there that's either surface ships or submarines. U.S. submarines have never operated as far as I know in the Black Sea. This would require, again, aircraft overhead monitoring them, which would mean flying into Ukrainian airspace, which I, find, I, I seriously doubt will happen. Uh, I am of the opinion that convoys and escorts into the Black Sea is a non-starter. I don't see it happening unless the Russians decide to strike that fleet of vessels off the Danube coast. That's within Romanian territorial waters. That would be Article 5 of NATO. And that such a strike like that would have repercussions. The Russians haven't targeted them yet. They haven't struck at them yet. But the danger is, what if they start striking those ports, those southern ports on the Danube River right across from Romania? What if they hit Rene and the Izmir? What if they hit the ships uh, in those ports? Then you may see a trigger. And if the Romanians and the Bulgarians ask for assistance and the Turks permit passage in, you may see a NATO operation. It's not going to be a UN operation. The Russians will boycott that. They'll veto it in the Security Council. Potentially, the only thing you can potentially see is a NATO operation. But again, the Turks are fighting against the inclusion of Sweden and Finland into the alliance right now. So I don't think we see Tom Hanks leading a destroyer into the Black Sea. I think we continue seeing Castaway, where basically mariners are trapped, ships are trapped. Uh, he can't deliver his FedEx package. We continue to have a problem in Odessa, Apollo 13, and the potential is what happens when Captain Phillips, Tom Hanks, gets grabbed or attacked. Does the world respond to it? Do we send in the USS Bainbridge and a amphibious group to go in and solve the situation? I don't know, but again, we find ourselves in a world situation in which we turn to you, Tom Hanks, to give us the solution. I don't know what it is but that's the way it lays out today. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you be alerted about new videos as they come out, leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, go watch a Tom Hanks movie. There's nothing better than to watch a Tom Hanks movie. Go watch a Tom Hanks movie. And if you can, head on over to our Patreon page, which has been revamped and updated with new tiers of membership, including special membership privileges and packages for those who get into it. I uh, want to thank some of our Patreon subscribers for contributing to the page. I want to thank Pegleg Pete for his uh, membership. I appreciate that. James Bianco, Jay Mincemeyer, Mark Wells for their contr contributing to the Patreon page. I appreciate it a lot. Going to be doing some Patreon-only videos just for them to make sure uh, joining the page uh, has some oomph to it. So I appreciate it again. And so if you have an opportunity, please go over. It helps support the page, allows me to do this, keep videos coming, and more importantly, keep peanut fed all the time. Because again, I got to keep my worker staff well supplied. Until the next video, this is Sal signing off.